Coming up on St. Paul Forum, we'll be speaking with an author, independent historian, and retired architect, Brian McMahon. Welcome to St. Paul Forum, I'm Georgia Ford. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with an author, independent historian, and retired architect. He goes by the name of Brian McMahon. Welcome to thank the show. You. Nice and to be here. Thank you, thank you for coming. Um, you have really, really fought to preserve the history of St. Paul, even though you're not a native. It's in my genes. I fought to preserve the history of New York City all the time that I was there, which was about 50 years. Uh, so it's, it's, don't ask me where it comes from, but as far back as I can remember, I've been interested in historic buildings and uh, ended up going to architecture school. I studied historic preservation and historic architecture uh, and uh, worked in that field professionally for a number of years and uh, came out here to St. Paul and worked in the field of economic development, community development and uh, it dovetailed very nicely because, with my personal interest, because old buildings such as the one we're in right now mm -hmm. have a great uh, economic uh, contribution to make to the community uh, in terms of character and bringing some uh, important historic connections. And it's a very important part of understanding the built environment. You have to understand the history of the community. Absolutely. Now, Brian, yeah. it's pretty interesting how your passion for history and architect led you to advocate for the Green Line. Yes, I was actually hired in 2001 by a community group called University United, mm -hmm. and they knew of my background in, uh, in New York, and, uh, and uh, they felt that I would be a good fit for what this community would be facing, which is getting ready for this once in a generation transformation that will be brought about by the billion dollar light rail line running right through the community along University Avenue. Most of the, and again, this is like six years before uh, it actually was up and running. Wow. And most people were very skeptical that this thing would ever happen in their lifetime, had seen other earlier efforts kind of come and go, a mm -hmm. lot of talking, and at the end of the day, nothing to show for it. Um, but we took our task seriously. We, uh, we were, from day one, trying to get the community ready from a planning, uh, architectural, urban planning, economic uh, perspective for these changes that would be coming and position them to take advantage of the great opportunities. Uh, I'm a very uh, firm advocate in uh, transit, transit-oriented development, a little bit higher density than perhaps some of the people here had been used to. In fact, when I started, there had been no um, multi-story, uh, multi-family homes built on University Avenue. Wow. In fact, I don't think any homes built on University Avenue in 75 years. So my first reaction is, here you've got this major commercial corridor between the two cities. You've got a great bus line. Where's all the housing? I mean, mm -hmm. this if there was ever a natural place for the housing, this would have been it. So I really enjoyed that, that job and worked at it for about 12 years, 13 years. The light rail line was built. Uh, it has had all of the uh, transformative effect that uh, I and many others uh, said it would have. Mm -hmm. We're talking billions of dollars in new development, thousands of new units. Uh, and you know, that brings good things, but it also brings some challenges, and we were certainly aware of that. So our function, was to get the community to understand exactly what would happen. And we could use some very kind of high-tech uh, visioning techniques and architectural tricks to try to get people to really see the alternatives and be able to decide, well, this one's got some benefits, but here's some other options and alternatives. So it was always a matter of uh, options. Never, mm -hmm. this is good, that's bad. It's like there are four or five different ways this could be done, and let's look and learn from each of them. 
So uh, it was essentially a small urban planning office studio that we set up, staffed uh, by several professionals and uh, lots of great volunteers from the university. So um, they got good training. We got state-of-the-art expertise from these young students. And uh, I think it was a great, great experience all around. But I also got to know very well uh, a lot of the old historic buildings along University mm -hmm. Avenue. So and again, there are many. And there are many. Yes. And um, this allowed me to uh, indulge my lifelong interest with my work uh, because on some occasion they wanted to, the various parties wanted to knock down some buildings and I was pretty vocal about mm -hmm. trying to preserve the buildings. In fact, one of the ones that, uh, that played a major role in my time here was the uh, Ford Building at 117 University Avenue down by Rice. Right, and you actually wrote a book. Uh, I did. Surrounding a lot of the three the Ford research. plants. Yeah, yeah, the three Ford plants. And um, you did mention a little bit about the the book that you wrote, but what inspired you to really uh, dive in into the history of the Ford plant? The book is called The Ford Century in in Minnesota, and um, like you said, it's been a staple here in our community and has really provided a lot of people over uh, the decades, employment and other economic opportunities. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, there were actually three separate assembly plants that Ford built in the Twin Cities, one in Minneapolis uh, that's been converted to a 10-story uh, office, high-end, very attractive office building right down by the uh, Twin Stadium, the Ford building. Uh, this three-story one on the university by the Capitol and then the last one to be built in 1924 was a single story, sprawling, state of the art, beautiful building on several hundred acres that uh, was the first year to utilize the assembly line. Um, so you can see the progression from the 1913 buildings to the, within a decade, the whole way to process and manufacture cars just completely changed. The assembly line basically was it and machinery and automation. And um, so that had a run of about, what, 80 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, part of my interest in the, in the book was looking at it over the long arc of history and seeing how things changed over the course of a century. And, um, you know, the first 50 years of that century, you could say that the workers were really struggling hard to get to the point where uh, they could get a living wage job and, uh, and manufacturing would be a, a career, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, for the new middle class. And by the end of the century, you know, it was kind of like the sliding right down back to where we began, which is to say that um, the workplace had changed so much, the companies were starting to outsource, um, the workers were losing their mm -hmm. hard earned gains. Um, it was very hard to think of this as a place where you could continue to raise a family, uh, in particular with the one wage earner in a household. Those days were all history. So I was able to show that whole evolution uh, using automobile manufacturing and kind of through the eyes of the workers and through the eyes of the buildings, if you will. And, uh, but for me, it always kind of starts with the building. I, I went there because I'm interested in industrial architecture. It was designed by the, one of the preeminent uh, and most important industrial architects in the world, Albert Kahn. Um, and I arranged to go in and uh, take a tour of how they were making cars, because if, if you want to understand a building, you got to know what's going on in the building. Mm -hmm. I was just mesmerized. I'll be honest. I just could not believe what it was like to see the raw materials coming in one end in the parts and then the finished car being driven off the lot and lots of robots and all kinds of activities, so it was great. Uh, I got to meet a lot of the workers and uh, over the next f five, eight years, interviewed a lot of them, it was a lot of oral history, and just at the right time, because some of these were old timers who had started way back before the union, we're talking before the depression even, um, mm -hmm. so got a lot of history there, and a lot of it is through the eyes of the workers, but, um, you know, these kinds of projects are just an excuse for me to go out and learn something new. <laughs> That's why I do it. I, it. It didn't start out as me wanting to write a book. Well, I think it's really amazing, and I understand that you're 
a retired historian and you're working independently now, mm -hmm. or I should say semi-retired. Yeah, but just I, 40 hours a week. <laughs> so I, I used to write the books on the weekends and in my evenings. Now I... You do it full time. Full time. <laughs> that's that's a, a beautiful thing to do what you love. And yeah. I was going to say, as a, a St. Paul native, I kind of feel like I know you're a historian. I know this is what you have a knack for, but I should know some of this stuff being from from here. Uh, but I'm, I'm learning so much from you and, and uh, your research that you have done about our community and uh, that that research and that that same passion now has been projected into a different building yes which is located uh, near our studios here yeah. uh, just just down the road yes uh, it, uh, it's known as the American can company building uh, up at 755 prior uh, Avenue st. Paul up by uh, Pierce Butler the name is a bit of a misnomer I'll give you a little bit of the history. Well, let me tell you how I got interested in this building. First of all, it's a great old building. It's a great old factory sprawling building. So, I mean, the first time I saw it, I said, what is this? I got to learn more about it. And shortly after uh, I started here, American Can, the successor company, actually shut it down. It's, there's so many parallels to Ford. Um, that it was fairly remarkable and uh, threw all of the unionized can workers out and uh, the building sat empty. Uh, nobody wanted these big old hulking uh, monstrous four block long structures. This has got this huge smokestack which is visible. It's really quite the landmark you can spot it in every direction. Uh, and uh, it sat there and there were a lot of discussions about tearing it down, I said that would be a big time mistake. Mm -hmm. Not only does it have history, at the time I didn't know a lot about the history, but I knew it had a history, a hundred years of manufacturing. But I also know that old industrial buildings have a great future. These are the most appealing buildings for what we call the artisan Absolutely. economy. Uh, people uh, the millennial generation, they don't want to work in a skyscraper it's with the, the glass walls and, and all the above. They want something with some character, some brick, some charm, some history. Mm -hmm. And, um, we, you know, St. Paul's a little bit behind the curve on, on understanding that where I come from. There's a lot of, there's uh, millions <laughs> of square feet of buildings that have been retrofitted. Well, the whole city. I mm -hmm. was... Uh, in the construction design business, and I didn't work on one new building. Everything <laughs> I worked on for a dozen years wow. was fixing up old buildings. And I've been to Atlanta and Charlotte and other metropolitan right. cities, and they're all doing the same. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I did a lot of work through University United to position this building t to help sell it. We, we did all kinds of architectural schemes and plans and ideas. Again, free. We just basically put it out there. If we believe in a particular cause of some sort, we will put some options on the table to help further that uh, nice. as a reality. And um, we finally found a developer, not, not through any efforts of ours, I don't think, uh, from, from California that came in here and bought the building really cheap. Mm -hmm. I mean, really cheap. And saw the value in it got it at a bargain basement price, and it's now functioning exactly the way it needed to function, mm -hmm. which is all these small, small little craft shops and uh, artsy kinds of things. Well, I know as a mother, it, the thing that has attracted me to that building is uh, Can Can Wonderland. Yes. I have not had the opportunity to take my 10 year old there yet, but we've went online and, and we've uh, checked out the website and she's really, really excited to go. It's like a mini golf. Uh, yes, it's an artist design, mm -hmm. miniature golf course. Uh, it is very exciting. It's very attractive, and uh, it's a bit of a remote area, if you will, on the edge of uh, the Midway uh, in this old hulking industrial building. But, but it's spectacular. Well, and where else do you, you know, go play mini golf in the middle of the city anyway? Where you got that so, much room where you can exactly. actually spread it out. Yep. And so I uh, think it's something fun for parents, for kids. Totally. Um, especially in the, the Frogtown community. It's not really far out of the way. Yep. It's not super expensive. So it's um, something different too. A different form of entertainment other than Absolutely. just kind of going to the movies, sure. you know, once a week or whatever. Something to do different. But that's not the only 
only thing that the building is currently hosting. Correct. Uh, there's a great brewery called Black Sack. Wonderful beer, a great facility. Uh, Maybe I, not for the kids. Uh, not for the kids, <laughs> although <laughs> it is kind of the overflow waiting area so the, the, maybe, maybe the parents uh, can, can hang out down there. But uh, that is in a huge space where they used to make cans, mm -hmm. spam cans in wow. particular. We're talking billions Yum. of spam cans. <laughs> so uh, I often meet with retirees there, mm -hmm. enjoy the, uh, the, uh, the beverages that they produce. Uh, but there's also a company there that makes trailers, small trailers, recreational trailers that you attach to a car, travel tra uh, trailers. You got a lot of artists, uh, graphic designers, um, things of that sort. It's a great, you know, these are rental tenants. These are not uh, $50 million companies that want to own something. Um, they're, they're not startups, but mm -hmm. they're uh, early stage development, and they need a place. And they want to be with like-minded people and like-minded companies. It's a creative, um, exciting environment. And anybody who goes there immediately understands why it would be a tragedy to knock down buildings like these. Absolutely. And yeah. you know, uh, before we wrap things up, I'm interested to know, uh, because you explained that your research of the Ford company and the Ford buildings led to a book after many, many years. So now I'm curious to know, is your research of this other historic building going to lead to another book? Well, it could. It certainly is deserving. It's a, it's a fascinating story. Can, you say cans? How can you make cans interesting? Well, and then you have the whole issue of canning. That transformed our way of life, that you could actually preserve foods. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you could argue that you couldn't see the development of cities without that kind of uh, stocked food being available. And um, 1915, if you walked into a uh, grocery store or whatever they would call it back in those days, 40% uh, of the, the food items would be in cans. So it absolutely changed our life. It changed it for the, for the farmers. Mm -hmm. They now, instead of having just a seasonal opportunity to, 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 to sell their produce, they could do it all year round. And so there are lots of things. Uh, it made uh, great uh, jobs for people uh, during the heyday. Well, everything from spam cans to beer cans, the 50s and 60s were monstrously successful. This was a very successful company. Uh, they pioneered the beer cans. They were working three shifts, a couple of thousand workers, seven days a week, making all kinds of ham, hams beer, um, grain belts. It was a booming place. And what's really fascinating to me is hardly anybody knew about it, except the workers in the circle that, they, that they're from. Uh, any other company that made a billion of anything, you would think you would have known what the company was doing. And uh, it's amazing to me how little people know about that building and yeah. its history. Yeah, I'm from here and I didn't know, but it's kind of, I see now, a play on words with the can-can Oh, the can-can, that's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. Yeah, no, speaking, they, yeah. speaking of cans, I know you have some of those well, I did. Uh, artifacts uh, with well, you. Sure, I mentioned that uh, spam was their big thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, because Hormel, of course, here is a Minnesota company. Wow. And that, you know, the thing, the reason why they wanted to locate at the Minnesota transfer, so they, during Harvester, built the first building, but uh, uh, they consolidated, they became a monopoly with their chief uh, rival, if you will, McCormick, and became International Harvester. Mm -hmm. So the building was empty. After uh, American Can bought this little tin shop in downtown St. Paul, the place burned down, they ended up coming out here oh, wow. to be uh, in the old uh, uh, Harvester building, to be near the Minnesota Transfer, which was this great network of trains exchanging mm -hmm. freight, which gave any company uh, a way to access raw materials from any part of the country right. and uh, sell their products all over the, uh, the place. So this one actually looks like it's, it's oh, this shipped is out to another country. Oh, uh, no, uh, yes, this one is. They did make spam uh, in, in uh, 90 different countries and languages and things like that. And the, you know, there's always these issues where, where somebody looks at this thing, you don't even know what language no. that is. And, uh, the cans get sent to the wrong country because mm -hmm. nobody knew <laughs> where it was supposed to go. But uh, I talked to one retiree who said he made, he personally made 
over a million of these tops wow. for the cans over his over 30, 40 career, <laughs> year career. Uh, but it's not just beef, but so there was this cluster of other businesses right in that area who made everything from cigars mm -hmm. um, to vegetables to candies to uh, oils and the like. Everything was made in cans. Mm -hmm. here's, here's a can that sold, uh, uh, that packaged uh, just right cigars. It was a company called Warch Cigars that was right on University, close, close to Fairview. And they put their five cent cigars in there. And uh, here's a can. This, so that was almost undoubtedly uh, made at, it had to have been made at uh, American Can, which is literally wow. right around the corner. Another big and factory. And they were only five cents back Five then. cents back in those <laughs> days. Um, and uh, Griggs Cooper was there. They made chocolates. They made crackers, cookies. They also had cigars. Um, and a lot of their products were packaged in cans. Mm -hmm. Here's a wonderful can made by American it's Can. It's so beautiful, and we'll get a close up of that. Um, Japanese lots, design. Lots it's, of detail. Yeah, it's not. I'm not sure where it was made. Although, if, if I really spent some time, I think it is an American Can company product. Although there were others, mm -hmm. but this came from a set of six spices, and they each actually had a label on them. And uh, I do an occasional shopping on uh, eBay. Mm -hmm. And it uh, just goes to show you the, uh, uh, the type of uh, fascination there is among the collector community. Now, here's an odd one. This is a Hormel can, and it's probably one of the strangest cans. It's shaped Spiced ham. to look like <laughs> a loaf of uh, a, a slice of rye bread. Mm -hmm. So they literally could just slice the, uh, the ham mm -hmm. and throw it right on, right on, on the, the bread. Right yeah. on the bread. Okay. So here's one that's, it's, and it's not just cans, it's, uh, all kinds of containers. This is, uh, looked to me like it was probably chocolates um, and tin, tin cans, you know? Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm interested, Brian. Yep. You, you start out with a fascination yep. of a particular building. Right. And so then this, you know, passion for the architecture of the building, it turns into research and you start collecting artifacts. How do you end up uh, finding these artifacts and how do you end up getting in touch with uh, former employees or uh, former managers in order to put together and compile all of this That's a really question. unique uh, research? Well, I learned a lot of tricks from doing the Ford. That took me, I have to confess, 15 years, again, not working full time. But uh, I used a lot of the same techniques that I figured out eventually with Ford, which is try to find the uh, retirees association. And that's not even that easy. If you don't know anybody that mm -hmm. worked there, it's not easy to get your foot in the door. But just by some quirk, uh, I, I managed to meet somebody who worked there. He told me that the uh, retirees actually get together for luncheons on a quarterly basis. So he told me when the next one was, I show up, 50, 60 retirees, and I introduced myself and passed around a little flyer. Said, I'd love to talk to you and get to know you. And that's how I got most of these materials. Uh, these are my teachers. Uh, they're probably several hundred, 300, maybe 400, still around. Like I said, at one time, they were a thousand workers mm -hmm. at, at any given time. So I'm curious to know, once your research is done, mm -hmm. What will you do with all the artifacts? Well, uh, if it was up to some of my family members, <laughs> notably my wife, <laughs> these things would be out of the upstairs uh, bedroom I and out imagine. of the uh, sheds <laughs> and out of this and out of that. Uh, I'm actually in the process of looking for uh, a repository, some sort of a museum. That would be fascinating. Uh, that would take all of these things and would take uh, a lot of my Ford stuff. I have a lot of Ford stuff too. So, you know, I ended up buying these things over the years, $10 here, $20 there. Uh, doesn't seem like much, but uh, you add it up over 15 years. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a bit of an investment for me. Uh, I bought a worker's badge, the most expensive thing I think I bought. They had these employee badges, a, a medal. Uh, uh, a really attractive thing. I think it cost me two hundred fifty dollars. Jeez! But it was for the Minneapolis plant, and it was very rare. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an auction yeah. on eBay, and um, so it, it's not easy. You, you know, I want the stuff to be held together as some kind of a learning place mm -hmm. where retirees. There's a lot more stuff out there. 
that retirees would be delighted to give, especially those that are getting up in years, mm -hmm. they're empty nesters, they're moving into an apartment. You know, a lot of this stuff is gonna get lost. I know that a lot of Ford stuff didn't go with them. It mm -hmm. ended up in the dumpster or to right. the kids who really have no interest. So right. uh, I'm hoping through mediums such as this that we can uh, show people what we've got and explain why it's valuable to keep get a museum or if we have to you know we'll just try to find something temporary I'm working on it for sure well Brian before we go mm -hmm. I do want to thank you for all of your hard work and for your dedication to the history of St. Paul um, you have really dedicated a lot of your time and even as you said your money to preserving our history collecting it mm -hmm. and uh, really going above and beyond to do this research um, I think, you know, just a suggestion, it would be awesome if some of these artifacts could be preserved in the actual building. Yep. You know, if there could be a, a small dedicated space. Well, that would be we're, we're trying that. Um, haven't had success yet. And I don't know why, but it, I mean, it would seem to be a natural thing. It's, it's such fun stuff, you know, to uh, put this in, the, in your vestibule mm -hmm. or in your rental office or something like that. So we're still working on it. So the last project took you 15 years. Do you have any estimation yeah. of when we can see maybe couple of years. a book? A couple few of couple years. years, yeah. I mean, I have a, a pretty good, uh, serious article and even already, and even if it, it doesn't get beyond that, um, I think we've, we've made a contribution here. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I've done most of the research, and I'm hoping that I could wrap it up in a couple of years. Uh, I don't have a publisher. I actually have a publisher for another book I'm working on. And what's that book about? Uh, that's that's an architecture book. Okay. It's about Henry Ford's architects. Uh, uh, he built a lot of things besides factories. He built housing projects. He built hospitals. He built really? airport terminal, hotels. Interesting. Uh, uh, things of that sort. Uh, and it's like eight architects that really collectively transformed architecture, or at least um, really showcased the, what was happening in the, in the world of architecture. Wayne State University Press is gonna be doing that for me. So we don't have a publisher, uh, but you know, I got 40 hours a week working and I'm plugging. That's more like 50 hours, I'm gonna say. And uh, well, well it, it, if I have to put it on the web, it's gonna go on the web, but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get the information out. I'm really too deep into it at this point to uh, Absolutely. stop now. So is there a collective place uh, where people can see the work that you do and maybe even contact you if they have some insight on the history? of the now Can Can Wonderland building? Well, I will uh, give you my uh, website, and uh, but I'm gonna make sure I upload a lot more stuff now that it's out there to the world. It's been a little uh, closely held, and that is brianjmcmahon.com. Uh, I will put some of these materials up. Uh, I will put up my uh, draft article on Can specifically. Uh, which really is just a little slice of this story. Believe mm -hmm. me, there's so many, you take every other page there and you could write a chapter on, but it gives you a quick kind of an overview. Um, the workers would be great. I'd love to do an extensive oral history program with them mm -hmm. because when they start talking, you really get some stories yeah. and you really I get bet. the flavor I bet. Uh, of what it was like to work in a can company. Um, and you know, this is, this is a thing that's dying, this industrial era. Mm -hmm. The American industrial century, if you will, is pretty much fading away. And uh, even these folks know that this is pretty much the end of the line. They were at the, the, the end of the line yeah. for a lot of this stuff, so. And that's what, what you do, or that's why what you do is so important. Yeah to preserve that history and to compile it in a way where us millennials can understand it and appreciate it and, uh, you know, not, not take it for granted. Exactly. So. Exactly. We would like thank to you. thank you again My for pleasure. your dedication sure. and for your time and okay. sharing all of your hard work with us. Thank you so much for watching St. Paul Forum. You can find this episode and previous episodes online at SPNN.org.